Hey everyone, this is George Coase with another epic book review. Okay, so I just love doing the book review because I love the theme music. Hey everyone, thanks for being here today. And what I'm actually doing for the book review today is this book called The Happiness Project by... Gretchen Rubin, and probably a lot of you have read this book or know of it. It's been making the rounds over the years. And again, it's just a book I found in like a pile. I must have bought it at some point and I don't remember buying it at all, but it just weirdly just showed up in a pile. I'm like, it's maybe time to read this book. And I did, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but I've committed to this year. I'm going to really encourage you if you're watching this on YouTube and if you're not watching this on YouTube, go over to YouTube because I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. If you could like this video, subscribe because I want to share more of these reviews and I want to get this out to people and connect. And I think this is a really great way to just really just solidify my learning and sharing my takeaways of the book. And one of the questions I have, and if you can share in the comments down below, because a lot of people that watch this are educators. And this is a question I, I've been thinking about as I was preparing for this podcast, writing some notes down, that are happiness and learning connected in school. And I was thinking about this right before I started recording this podcast. The idea of happiness when we're talking about learning, sometimes learning is a little bit miserable. And some of the things that we go through are really stressful, really tough. And I think a lot of times what we do is we try to connect Everything should be just exciting and really exhilarating, but that's not always true. And for me, some of the stuff that has been the most meaningful has been the toughest. And I actually really can't think of anything that was really meaningful that wasn't tough. And so part of that is enjoying the process, but sometimes understanding the process is not fun. It's not exciting. So Maybe sitting on that question and thinking about it, maybe you have different interpretations of this, but again, the question is, and I would love your thoughts, are happiness and learning connected in school? And how would you interpret that question? I think it's a really good thing um, to think about. And so when I picked up this book and started reading it, I felt like I was going through my own little happiness project. I've really tried to been try I've really been trying to focus on my own mental health, my own well-being, my physical well-being and I truly believe they are interconnected with one another. And sometimes I feel that when I'm struggling physically, it affects me emotionally and when I'm struggling emotionally, it affects me physically. There there is a connection between the two and sometimes when I have the most confidence in myself, I find some connection. So just trying some different things, even this focus on trying to learn things outside of education, reading these books, doing these book reviews. It is part of this maybe George Kuros personal happiness project. So I was just thinking about this and and when I'm looking about the reading this book, really thinking about how when we talk about happiness, a lot of times we focus on an end goal of something that we can achieve. But I think it's always about tweaking, always that process, developing habits. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Atomic Habits, really looking at do we enjoy that process. And so I'll talk a little bit as we go in this book. And the way Gretchen Rubin actually, she actually separates this book is basically in month, chapters are a month. And so each month she's focused on something different to see what that process is and what it looks like. And it's an interesting journey to see her progression. I'm not going to ruin it. I'm just going to give you some of my thoughts as we're going this. And there is a quote in it that really resonated with me. And it's part of the reason, as I said, I was picking up this book is that they say that people teach what they need to learn. And I think that's why I'm sharing this book is because I feel like I'm on this journey myself, really trying to find purpose and passion in my every single day. And many times I find that in my family, I find that in my work, but sometimes I also feel there, there's something missing and just that pursuit. And I think the pursuit, there is some joy in that process as well. When you think about the idea of like, why does even happiness matter? I was thinking about that and really, I wrote down this comment and I thought about this is that when people are unhappy with their lives, they often try to control yours. 
And so think about maybe some of the relationships we've had in the past, including myself. And I'm not just talking about people I've been in a relationship that I wasn't really excited about, but maybe even my own behaviors. Sometimes we get into these situations where we're lacking our confidence, where we're lacking some issues, or we're having some issues in our lives. And then what do we do? We try to control people outside of us. A lot of times when you get negative comments online, social media, it's, a, it's not a reflection of you. It's a reflection of the person commenting. And so I think that finding that happiness, and some people might disagree with that, and that's okay. And that's okay if you disagree with that. But a lot of times when we give our happiness that control to other people, we lose control of ourselves. And when we have unhappiness in our own lives, we tend to do things that maybe try to control others that if they were doing something different, maybe I'd be happier. And I just don't see life that way. I really try to find that in myself. When I'm struggling, I've grown up doing this. And when I've grown up, it's not like I've done this my whole life. I've really tried to focus this, especially in the last few years. I look internally, and I'll give you an example of this. Sometimes when I'm on social media, on Instagram, I will see a picture or a video of someone, even a friend, doing really well. And I also to get kind of snarky about it. I like people bragging all the time, having these connections. And when I start to do that over and over again, I'm like, ooh, I got to get off here. This is, me. this is a me issue. This is a me thing that's going on right now. That why would I not be happy for the success of someone else? Especially in education, you think about that. There's a lot of people I watch criticize adults for doing things that... They don't necessarily, I'm not saying they necessarily agree with people, job choices or career choices. And I always think if that was one of your students, would you be doing the same thing? Or is it just because you never taught them, you don't care? And so really, I really try to look internally that when I start noticing that I start getting a little grumpy or with other people, I start looking, is it like, what is going on with me right now? And how do I address that? And so I think that's something that I really think about. There's a lot of conversations about social media right now, how it's affecting young people and honestly, how it's affecting old people like myself. And it's that idea of how we struggle that we don't have the lives of other people, that we don't have a lot of those things. And the way I always talk about social media is that it is ESPN Sports Center. It's not a full game. You're just seeing the highlights, the best parts. And really what we have to do is teach our students, ourselves, that's just a snapshot. And it's not that people aren't sharing their authentic selves. They're, they're sharing what they want to share, what they want people to see. And thinking about this in context, I don't swear on social media. I really try to be cognizant. I don't share stuff that has swearing in it. And it's not that I don't swear. I swear horribly sometimes. But it is actually that I just understand the situation. So it's not like people aren't being authentic. They're just thoughtful of the situation that they're in. So instead of telling kids, hey, you need to get off social media because it's affecting your behavior, maybe sometimes that, or your feelings of yourself, maybe that's sometimes what we should do. Um, it is actually getting them to understand that what someone else does and what someone else has in their life is not really uh, a reflection of yourself. Focus on what you're doing. And one of the things I've learned over the years is that when I start to feel jealous of someone having something, I don't, I don't actually start to dismiss that person. But I actually look and say, what did they do to get to that situation? And what are some of the things I can learn from that? What are some of the things I could take from their journey from their life that I can grow from to get better and really trying to say like, how do I control this instead of leaving that situation more mad and maybe that's a little TMI, but just something I was thinking about as I was reading this. And so here's a short summary of the book as I asked ChatGPT, and I did read the whole book, but I like this. I, when I use ChatGPT to do this, the easiest way that I get these summaries is I just ask ChatGPT to do a five tweet thread. And it just makes it nice and succinct, but tells me the whole story of the book. Here it is from ChatGPT. The Happiness Project is a memoir self-help book where Gretchen Rubin chronicles her, her year long journey to boost her happiness. Ruben identifies 12 areas of her life to focus on and separated in months, as I shared before, including relationships, work, and play, and sets specific goals for each. Through experimenting with new habits and reflecting on her progress, she discovers what truly brings her joy and fulfillment. And just as an aside, sometimes she figures out what actually doesn't work, which I find interesting as well. The book offers practical tips 
and insights for readers to create their own happiness projects and lead more fulfilling lives. Overall, The Happiness Project is an inspiring and relatable read that encourages readers to prioritize their own happiness and invest in the things that matter. And inspiring, that's always up to the reader. I actually found it was quite inspiring, to be honest with you, and relatable was an easy one. The key word that I picked out of the last tweet that I shared there was talking about investment. And I think about that term quite a bit. And a lot of times people equate the word investment with money, monetary things. But I also think probably the biggest and most important investment is time and how we actually find that time. And here's something I talked about in education quite a bit when we talk about investments. There is a correlation. I actually shared this in Innovate Inside the Box. The book, Ohio State actually did a study that said simply greening kids in the hallways is actually improves math and reading scores. Now, math and reading scores are not the end all be all school. But if you said to me, hey, we started greeting our kids in the hallway before they entered their classroom, they started doing better. And I would agree whether you had research on it or not. Because what I understand is that we ensured that people felt valued as soon as they walked in to our buildings. And it actually leads to this. But the reason I bring this term up in, in terms of, or this idea up in terms of investment is that when you think about that, some people say, I don't have time, I'm super busy. First thing in the morning is a really tough time to do this. But that investment that we make into the people we serve is gonna actually save us time later. It's gonna be less classroom management. Probably a lot, a lot more fulfilling day when we build those relationships first thing in the morning. You can check in on some of our students when they're struggling that day and maybe address things right at the beginning. So a lot of times when we invest our time, it comes back tenfold. And Stephen Covey talks about this in the speed of trust, that when we make those investments and build trust, we build relationships, it comes back tenfold. So also when you're thinking about this term investment, I think about in the mornings, I always cut off these times where I'm working out because that brings me some clarity in the morning, brings me some joy. I find time to not necessarily meditate, but focus on gratitude first thing in the morning set out my vision for the day. And that used to be a thing that I thought about was like just a waste of time. But that time I spend actually helps my day to be better. So when you think about that investment, and it can actually be money too. And there, there's actually, there's a lot of studies that money doesn't necessarily make you happier depending on how you spend it. So if you're looking at material things, it typically doesn't bring happiness. But when you're looking at experiences, or finding ways to make the lives of others better, it actually does bring happiness. There's a lot of studies that talk about that and share this. So I was just thinking about that term investment and why it matters so much. And so here are a few quotes that resonate with me and ideas that resonate with me that I just want to read from, from the book. And the first one is about this idea of the arrival fallacy. And I'll just summarize it and then I'm going to talk a quote about a quote that actually was shared. So the idea of the arrival fallacy is this idea that once we get to a certain point of a goal that we're trying to achieve, that we will find happiness, that we will finally get to that point. So thinking about this in the context of my own life over the past few years, really when I found success in my own weight loss journey, I really focused on the process, what I was doing every single day, what I was doing every single week, and what I had known is that if I hit a certain weight, that wasn't going to make me all of a sudden happy. It was finding the things that brought me joy every single day that helped that process. But as a byproduct, it helped me lose weight. And I'll talk about another professional example of this in a second. And so really, it's not about getting to that place where we find happiness. It's actually when we learn to enjoy the process. And that doesn't mean enjoy that we're always happy, nothing's ever hard but really finding joy in the daily opportunities that we have to make our lives better. And so what I appreciate about Ruben sharing about this in the book is that it's not that you shouldn't have goals. It's not that you shouldn't have endpoints, but it's really finding that joy in the process connected with one another. And so this is what she shares about that. But the arrival fallacy doesn't mean that pursuing goals isn't a route to happiness. To the contrary, the goal is necessary just as is the process toward the goal. 
Friedrich Nietzsche explained it well. The end of a melody is not its goal. But nonetheless, if the melody has not reached its end, it would not have reached its goal either. A parable. To enjoy now, there is something else I was going to have to master. My dread of criticism. So just thinking about that, really learning to love that process. And when I think about this professionally, and especially now, a lot of people are applying for jobs that they might have wanted. They're having that time of year where we're looking at maybe leaving the places that we're in. I've shared this story before. Really, when I became assistant principal, I had no intention of becoming assistant principal. And basically day two, I'm like, I want to be a principal. That's something I really enjoyed or I really wanted to do. And I started getting really focused on that. And as I got focused on that process, I started ignoring my current situation, how awesome it was, because I was just shooting for that next phase of my life. And when I started to realize that I really need to be present where I'm at, and if I do that really well, that principalship will come. It's not that I don't have that goal, but I feel that sometimes we lose the present in search of the future. And Think about this in education. A lot of school districts, they focus on their 10-year plan, but I've said this a million times. The kids in your building don't care about the 10-year plan. They care about what's happening right now. And the question we need to ask when we talk about education is not what are, is education going to look like 10 years from now, even though we can have that conversation. It should be more focused on what are we doing in our schools today and how will this impact these kids 10 years from now? Will they actually have an excitement for learning? Will they, will we stoke their curiosity? Are we extinguishing it? How will this actually benefit the work that we do today? How will it benefit our kids tomorrow? So that arrival fallacy, really thinking about that. Many of you listening to this probably have goals in your life, things you want to achieve. And those, that's great. And it's always something to shoot for. But just attaining those things isn't going to all of a sudden make everything better. It's learning to find that joy in the process, to find purpose and passion through that work. And I really, that, that, uh, that notion of the arrival fallacy really stuck with me. The next quote I'd like to share with you. Studies show that in a phenomenon called emotional contagion, we unconsciously catch emotions from other people, whether good mood, whether in a good mood or bad ones. Taking the time to be silly means that we're infecting one another with good cheer and people who enjoy silliness are one third more likely to be happy. So again, lots of educators are listening to this podcast right now. Think about this in terms of staff rooms. There are probably times that I've done this in my career. Some of you listening to this have done this in your career where you avoid the staff room because it can be a negative place and it can be a negative place where people vent sometimes about administration sometimes depending if you're admins in the staff room or not maybe they're in it and you're venting anyway maybe it's sometimes about kids that you know are having bad days and maybe having bad days continuously and we can get into this negative spiral and then we start getting in this space where yeah we start complaining about this and so we would avoid the staff rooms now i've had the opposite experience too i've had staff rooms that are just totally joyful places and brought me up and what's interesting is that when they bring you up when you go back to your kids it reflects right if you go into this negative space and you walk out of there it's not like you just switch off to to a positive demeanor and so really thinking about who do you surround yourself with and one of the things i've really been thinking about is do we avoid those staff rooms or do we actually go and try to change the climate? Because thinking about it in this sense, if we have those negative staff rooms and we avoid them and we don't do anything about it, we don't actually try to change the climate of that room, it might not affect the students you're working with, but what about the other ones that you might be working with? So it's just something to think about. And when I was reading this, I thought about a quote I've been shared and actually have been criticized for several times. And that's okay. I'm okay with criticism because I think there's more context to the story than a lot of people know. But this quote about we need to make the positives so loud that the negatives are almost impossible to hear. And a lot of times people have accused me of this is like toxic positivity. And I think a lot of times when I hear that term, it's sometimes coming from super negative people. Not always, but sometimes. And it's not that I don't think toxic positivity is a thing. The analogy I always give for toxic positivity is if my house is burning down that I'm sitting in the middle, I'm like, ooh, it's nice and warm in here. That's toxic positivity, right? I think part of it is if my house is burning down, I'd say, hey, my house is burning down. We need to figure something out to move this forward. 
And it's not you're ignoring the issues, it's actually that you're addressing them and finding a way forward. A lot of times people can be really focused on the problem, not on the solution. I think sometimes we get into these really negative spirals is because we're very problem focused on what's wrong. Not necessarily, what can we do to make it right? What can we do to make it better? And so really thinking about that, when you go into a staff room, are you a fountain or a drain? And trying to be that fountain, trying to lift people up. And it's not saying that there's no bad things in the world. It's not even saying there's no bad things in education. There's obviously a ton. How do we create the solutions? Are we those people that find solutions or just totally focused on the problem? And a lot of times, I'll be honest with you, focusing on the problem nonstop actually doesn't typically make the problem better. It actually sometimes makes things worse. And so how do we address it to find a solution moving forward? And so the last one I share with you is this one from Gretchen Rubin's book. Samuel Butler wrote, happiness and misery consist in a progression towards better or worse. It does not matter how high up or low down you are. It depends not on this, but, but on the direction in which you are t- tending. And I thought about this quite a bit. I, I've shared this before. I deal with anxiety, depression, things like this too. And there's, like I said earlier, there's mental aspects of this. There's sometimes physical aspects of this. Sometimes they're correlated. And I think really trying to focus on what are the things that bring me happiness? What are the things that bring me joy in a day? And trying to focus on those things. And I think about this when we're talking about the idea of emotional contagion how this affects my own children, how it affects the people that I surround myself with. I think a lot of times that it doesn't mean that we're happy all the time. It doesn't mean that everything's good. It means that we're in that pursuit. I think finding that happiness, whatever that looks like to you, I think that the journey is part of the role and understanding, yeah, life has ups and downs. There are situations where things are really bad and we have to deal with them, but it's always trying to find the opportunity finding new ways of looking at things in what we have. And I just shared this on Instagram just the other day that sometimes the best things that have happened to me were not getting the things I wanted, not getting a job I wanted, not getting a speaking engagement that I really, really wanted because it made me reflect and think about what could I do better? And maybe that wasn't for me. Maybe there's a new opportunity. And the old adage of like when one door closes, another door opens. That's true if you're looking for the door and you're willing to go through it. I think that's something that really matters to me. And I love that idea that it's not about an end point, it's a journey, but which way is your journey going? So as I share this with you all, just some final thoughts. First of all, I really enjoyed this book. I don't necessarily talk about books if I don't like them. I thought there's a really lot of value in this. And I thought about what brings me joy personally, what brings me joy professionally, and how blessed I am to have those opportunities to actually have this time to do this podcast. I, I, I love doing this. I love connecting with people, sharing these ideas and sharing my thinking. And I appreciate so many people that listen to this and this community and how people are connected to this. And I feel like there's some power in finding being on our own happiness project. What are the things that make you happy? What are some of the things that you maybe want to try and find those opportunities in things that you don't actually do? One thing I've shared before I actually, I actually, when I moved here to Orlando, one of the things I never used to do and I do every day now is actually, I walk my dogs in the morning at night and it's always a little bit of a pain to be honest with you, but the excitement that they, my dogs have doing that in the morning, it's like the best part of their day. And when it's the best part of their day and their tails are wagging, I actually, if I had a tail, it would be wagging as well it just brings me such joy to see their happiness. And I find that sometimes when we do things, not only for other people, but even for the pets in our lives that bring them happiness, it brings us happiness as well. And so find those things that not only bring joy to you, but bring joy to others. Because a lot of times there's a selfish, the selfishness in it. When we bring joy to others, it brings joy to ourselves. So I recommend this book. Check it out. The Happiness Project. Thanks for another, joining me for another ep- edition of the Epic Book Review. Have a wonderful day. Take care.